I know I promised we wouldn't do a huge amount of legal stuff uh, in these videos, but I do want to start with the legal definition of sexual harassment. Now, you know here that I talk about the EEOC. The EEOC is the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. They're the federal agency that oversees uh, complaints and investigations related to sexual harassment and other forms of discrimination. Sexual harassment is legally a form of sexual discrimination, and that is discriminating against somebody on the basis of their sex, gender, gender identity, and sexual orientation. Although those last two, uh, still a bit of a concern legally. Um, there's a debate as to whether or not the Title VII of the United States Code, which deals with harassment and discrimination in the workplace, whether that actually extends to gender identity and sexual orientation. The courts are split on that. I believe that ultimately, as I said before, from a function of culture, you should be operating in total respect of everybody, regardless of their sex, their gender identity, or their sexual orientation. But the EEOC oversees this matter on the federal level. There are state level agencies that are responsible for uh, administering the state law. The state law generally follows the federal law. It's a little bit easier to sort of maintain it that way. But oftentimes, the state law agencies will investigate smaller employers. Nominally, Title VII of the United States Code, which deals with sexual discrimination and harassment and, and other discrimination, only applies to employers who employ 15 or more individuals. So state law typically takes care of those, in, those employers uh, with 14 or fewer employees. So here's how the EEOC defines sexual harassment. Unwelcome sexual advances, requests for sexual favors, and other verbal or physical conduct of a sexual nature constitutes sexual harassment. When submission to or rejection of this conduct explicitly or implicitly affects an individual's employment, unreasonably interferes with an individual's work performance, or creates an intimidating, hostile, or offensive work environment. It's a lot of words, I know. And it's a lot of words that create a bit of a confusion. So let's sort of break this down a little bit. For conduct to be considered sexual harassment, there is two components. The first component is a behavior or sometimes a series of behaviors that are uh, conducted by an individual or individuals. It doesn't have to be just one person. And that conduct is generally of a sexual nature or refers to somebody's sex uh, and creates an effect. So we have the behavior and then we have the effect. The effect is that it impacts somebody's employment situation, whether it's their conditions of employment, pay, continued employment, promotion, advancement, or the place in which they have to work becomes so uncomfortable that people don't want to go to work there. And it creates these kinds of hazards and environments. So sexual harassment, in order to, to start to analyze it, we need to think about things in terms of components of behavior and effect. So let's talk about the behavior side of things first. So first, we have to talk about the idea that the behavior has to be unwelcome. Now, unwelcome behavior means that it, it's any sort of conduct. Whether that conduct is, con is done by a supervisor, by a coworker, owners. It could also be conducted by customers, vendors who come in. Uh, it could even be sexual harassment of a, a, a nature created by a, a stranger, somebody who's just come in once. It would have to be a pretty egregious situation uh, for one time to by a stranger to constitute sexual harassment, but it is possible. The behavior has to be unwelcome. If two people engage in banter with each other and neither one of them is offended, that particular incident or series of incidents, those things are not considered harassment. Now, I do have to say this, it does not take much to cross a line. 
So you may be able to engage in certain kinds of behavior and that be okay. It may even be welcome, but it may cross a line. So you could tell three off-color jokes, but suddenly the fourth one creates that unwelcome behavior. That is sexual harassment. Now, the facts and circumstances leading up to that harassment claim are certainly worth of investigation. And if there's been a pattern of allowing that kind of behavior to continue, then you create a situation where it's going to be difficult to prove sexual harassment. But that doesn't make the behavior unwelcome. So unwelcome behavior, that's the first starting point. Sexual advances. Now, in the sexual harassment world, sexual advances are often referred to as quid pro quo. Um, or I'm sorry, not quid pro quo. Sexual advances are something along the lines of simply asking somebody out on a date repeatedly after being told no repeatedly and continuing that behavior. Um, this could involve co-workers who are you know, asking people out on dates, asking people for sex, uh, asking people to engage in behaviors that are unwelcome that is of a sexual nature. So oftentimes this occurs between co-workers or between uh, customers, vendors, those sorts of folks that is unwelcome. Request for sexual favors. This is where we really get into the quid pro quo. This is where a supervisor uh, or supervisory employee creates a situation in which uh, continued employment or advancement in employment or um, pay increases are conditioned on sexual favors. So telling a su subordinate, if you want to get a pay raise, you have to sleep with me, is clearly sexual harassment. It does not require a pattern of behavior. Just the simple act of doing that is sexual harassment. And it is often put in a position of talking about uh, your em continued employment as being conditioned on any kind of sexual conduct or sexual behavior. So that's clearly something that most people understand as being outside uh, polite society, outside professional behavior, and conduct that pretty much everybody understands is improper. Then things get a little bit fuzzy. Other verbal or physical conduct of a sexual nature. Um, so I often tell the, the, the point of off-color jokes, but those kinds of things, some people sort of find them funny. If everybody's laughing, is it really unwelcome? Are people laughing voluntarily? Or are they laughing because everybody else is laughing? It's a very sort of hard line to draw. I often give this example as well. Example of what is the difference between saying that is a good looking suit and you look good in that suit. Now, it doesn't sound like there's much difference there. But if you say it's a good looking suit, you're referring to the suit. You're referring to the cut, the color, the appearance. You know, the whole sort of thing about the suit. The comment is about the suit. Saying you look good in that suit is now a comment on somebody's appearance. Now, would this one off, you know, offhand comment, one statement, um, one act or one conduct, piece of conduct be considered sexual harassment? Probably not. When we're dealing with verbal or physical conduct of a sexual nature, we often need something that is referred to as pervasive, uh, severe, pervasive, ongoing conduct of a sexual nature. Now, how often is severe? How often is pervasive? That is a, a, a question of fact that often has to be dealt with by courts in a situation or in an investigation to determine what's going on in terms of sexual harassment. So one comment might be enough, but it could be. Three comments might not be enough, but it could be. And that's the most difficult thing about judging the behavioral component of sexual harassment. Sexual harassment is often very subtle. Very rarely is it a, set, a situation, uh, I don't encounter it very often, 
it still happens, shockingly enough, but I don't encounter it very often in my practice, of requests for sexual favors by supervisors. Most of the time we're dealing with other verbal or physical conduct of a sexual nature that is ne that is come to a point of being pervasive and ongoing. So once we talk about the conduct, and again, the conduct is by any person that creates an effect in an individual's working environment. So we talk about sexual harassment, the impact component. When we talk about the conduct, the conduct has to either be a kind of a condition of employment or a retaliation for rejecting the conduct. So take our egregious request for sexual favors where a supervisor asks a subordinate that if you want to get this pay raise, you have to sleep with me. Okay. If you submit, if the, the subordinate submits to it, it's sexual harassment. If the subordinate rejects the sexual advance, and the, or rejects the, the, the request for a sexual favor, and the employer or the supervisor fires or takes some other negative job action, that too is sexual harassment, an impact conduct, uh, or an impact component. So the submission to or rejection of the conduct explicitly or implicitly affects. Okay, so if somebody gets fired for rejecting a sexual favor, that is explicitly affecting. If it's implicitly, it is things like getting passed over for promotion, getting passed over for opportunities for advancement or education or job assignments that are considered uh, plum assignments that are considered advantageous and those opportunities are be given, given to other employees. That's explicitly or implicitly affecting. An individual's employment. Now, this is the most direct sort of thing. Continued employment, uh, pay raises, uh, reassignment to, to uh, less favorable conditions, reassignment to less favorable situations, or demotion in duties. These are explicit impacts on the individual's employment themselves. Okay. Then we get to interferes with a person's work performance. So per, this is where pervasive conduct, sort of the off-color jokes, the, uh, the presence of, say, uh, for example, in a male-dominated uh, workspace, the presence of something like the Sports Illustrated Swimsuit Edition or pornographic magazines that are just simply present. And by the way, it can also work the other way. Uh, we'll talk about that in just a moment. But if, if the presence of this sexual conduct of, of activities that are pervasive and ongoing starts to affect somebody's work performance, even if they are not engaged in the behavior, that is still sexual harassment because it creates an environment that an individual's submission to that conduct becomes an, an implicit part of their work environment and it starts to in fact impact their work performance. Still sexual harassment. Or creates a hostile or offensive work environment. So typically in the legal context, Sexual harassment is often thought of as quid pro quo, the, re the request for sexual favors in advance for explicit employment benefits, or hostile work environment claims. So generally the two main families of claims. Those claims, uh, the hostile work environment claims are, are very fact specific, um, and they may involve multiple people creating an environment that somebody finds offensive or hostile. And sometimes management is involved, and sometimes management is not. But management still has a responsibility for ensuring that everybody's work environment is neither hostile nor offensive. So this is the sort of the legal.